Welcome to the darker side of boxing season three, episode number nine. This is the penultimate episode of season three, and it is about the real life Rocky, the Bayonne bleeder, Chuck Webner. An episode we've been very excited to cover for some time because it's a story in which it gives you all different elements of what boxing was about in the 70s, about what life was like in the 70s. But it also tells you a story about an individual who really came from nothing and got something out of his life which is a a great story, but there's also some real topsy-turvy moments and hilarious moments throughout the course of the episode. So definitely sit back and enjoy this one because I think, like you, Johnston, we're going to enjoy this too. Yeah, we will. He's a great character, Chuck Wepner, and he's he's got some fantastic lines and and some great stories, and and that's one thing you get with him is he's full of them. And it, like you say, he's a bit of a rags to riches story. And then it's, it's sort of one of those stories where you're like, good luck, Chuck. To what the fuck, Chuck? That's how I felt after sort of doing the research on this one. So, yeah, enjoy it. It's going to be a good listen. Now, although many associate Charles Webner with Bayonne in New Jersey, he wasn't born there. And he declared in his words, I was actually born in New York. I moved to Jersey when I was a year and a half old after my mother and father split up. My mother raised us here in the projects after that. He was born as an American citizen on February the 26th, 1939. But he is of German, Ukrainian and Polish descent. Chuck and his mother, Dolores Webner, moved to Jersey in the summer of 1940 to live with his grandmother on 28th Street near Hudson Boulevard, which is now known as Kennedy Boulevard. They lived in a Bayonne apartment house, which was managed by his nan, and he said... My grandmother used to be the superintendent of the building when I was a kid, and we lived in the basement. Chuck calls it a basement, but he actually lived in a room that was a converted coal shed. He later elaborated on his living conditions and said, There was one room for my mother, brother, and me. There was also a regular Polish room, a little section of the room divided by a curtain hung on a wire where we would go to change. We all slept in one big double bed. I had to wash in the cellar sink. You could see the dumbwaiters and the coal bins of the apartment building. It wasn't exactly the kind of place you wanted to bring your friends to. Now Bayonne is a city in Hudson County in the state of New Jersey, which had an overwhelmingly white population. Located in the Gateway region, Bayonne is situated on a peninsula between Newark Bay to the west and the Kill Van Cult to the south, and New York Bay to the east. While living with his mum, he saw less of his dad, Charles William Webner, but he would reappear later in his life and attend some of his fights. So his dad was also a heavyweight boxer who fought more than 100 professional fights in the early 1920s. And and Chuck said that he was a boxer puncher, but there were thousands of fighters in those days. The streets of Bayonne, was it was it was a very tough place for Webner to navigate through while growing up with plenty of gangs operating in the area. He told sports reporter Robert Excel, I boxed a little bit at the PAL when I was younger. I was nine, ten years old. Chuck said that he was a skinny kid and was always getting picked on. But when I shot past everybody, they left me alone. One of his closest pals was a guy called Pat Lavelle who admitted to being one of those who picked on Chuck when he was a kid. He actually said that I used to beat him up when we were kids. I even threw him off a roof once. God knows how that ended up. But speaking of his difficult surroundings, Chuck said, where I grew up, there were always two or three gangs. And more or less, you had to go up there and beat up the toughest guy to survive, which is what I did. I'd have a fight almost every week. He also recalled that one day the toughest guy in the neighbourhood actually stole his bike. He said he got mad and I beat him up. And then I'd become the toughest kid in the neighbourhood. The streets taught Chuck and his younger brother, Don Webner, how to defend themselves. So to earn some extra more pocket money, they actually began working as shoe shiners in taverns along the Broadway. And he remembered that some guys gave me a hard time until I grabbed one of them by the neck. By now, Chuck had earned a reputation as one of the toughest kids in the neighbourhood. And he said, 
I was never the bully, though. I hated bullies. But he did like to fight, admitting later in life that I broke a couple of guys' noses in street fights by shoving the palm of my hand into their nose. Well, that's one way to gain a little bit of respect and also (laughs) survive at the same time. Now, Chuck also said, one big advantage I had in street fights was blood never bothered me. Most guys, when they get cut or blood is pouring from the nose, they quit. For me, it was no big deal. When not fighting, Chuck showed promise as an athlete. He said that he was a gangly six-footer by the time he was 13 years old and attended Bayonne High School. Due to his size, he became a regular on the school basketball team, competing in local tournaments. He also played in the Basketball Police Athletic League and for the All-Star team. And you can find reports in the local newspaper about Chuck being tipped as a potential star. However, at the age of 15, Wepner decided to join the US Marines, enrolling illegally after seeing the film Battle Cry. He convinced his mum to sign phony papers and headed off to the Marine Corps in 1954. Wepner explained why he wanted to go into the Marine Corps and he said back then, not like today, joining the armed forces still seemed glamorous. I wanted an opportunity. It was while in the Marines he became a member of the boxing team, developing a reputation for being able to take a punch. Wepner said, I loved those Marine fights. I used to choke guys. You could do anything you wanted, as long as you were the guy standing at the end of three rounds. Those were the battles of attrition. During his three-year stint in the Marines, he recorded ten victories and became the military heavyweight champion of the Cherry Point, North Carolina Air Base. Chuck said, When I went into the Marine Corps, I boxed because there was extra liberty involved. You got the weekend off when you were on the boxing team. I was the military air base champion. Well, there you go. And in an unbelievable story, uh, there's this, there's very little on this, but it's very, it is, it's, I don't know, believe it if you want, but it was actually printed in the 1975 Sports Illustrated article. And it said Chuck Webner, actually, he told them that he pulled three pilots out of a crashed aeroplane, saving their lives. It's been said that when the plane crash landed, Webner assisted the crash team in putting out fires and saving the pilots. So there you go. Chuck was actually discharged from the Marines in 1959 and by 20, he was a husband with one child and another one on the way. He had shown promise as a basketball player, as we've said, and thought of a return back to the Colts, but decided to take time off instead. However, his mother had other ideas. The day he actually got home from the Marines, she told him that he was going to work in the midnight security shift at the Western Electric. Then in need of extra money to support his young family now, he began working as a bouncer at a bar. He said, it was more fun to start fights than stop them. Apparently, Chuck fought five men in a barroom scuffle and once boasted, I was undefeated in bathrooms, telephone booths and alleys. So for the next few years, Chuck worked as a bouncer and as a liquor salesman, something that he would continue to do throughout his whole boxing career. He was admired in Bayonne as well for his toughness and his willingness to stand up and be counted when trouble was imminent. So in the bars he frequented, towels were told of when a friend of his was beat up by three truck drivers and he came to his rescue. Another friend in 1975 said, he's not a bully, but don't press him. His friends often described him as just an ordinary guy. Then one summer in 1964, while Wepner was working at the Bayonne club called Tony Meadows, a a Powell's boxing coach actually was in this bar. And he went up to Chuck and he he told him that he needed a Golden Gloves heavyweight and asked him if he was interested. He loved a good scoff, so he thought, why not? Especially when he found out that he could earn more money beating up people. So he committed himself to boxing. Chuck admitted that someone from the Marine Corps talked me into going into the Golden Gloves in Bayonne. And I went to the New York Golden Gloves and won the heavyweight championship there. And I turned pro. And the rest is history. To enter the amateur ranks, Chuck needed a trainer. And as fate would have it, he bumped into Joe Barisi, the owner of a cleaners in Bayonne, and a part-time boxing trainer who has handled four Golden Gloves champions. He told the New York Times in 1975, I knew 
he was a local baseball and basketball star, but I'd never seen him until this big guy walked in one day to leave some clothes. From there, they struck up a partnership. Even Joe's wife added, I've been cleaning the blood out of his robe since he started, and I'm still doing it now. Chuck Webner moved into the amateur ranks at the age of 24 in 1963 and quickly established himself and he said, I cut through those guys like butter. They'd never seen anything like my style before. During this time, he also became a part-time policeman, as described in the New York Daily News when Chuck fought at Madison Square Garden, breaking the nose of the local talent Robert Listel. The article by John Stolfus was headlined, Bayonne Cop Upsets Listel in Sunnyside Glove Semi. He then wrote on March the 14th, 1964, Chuck Webner, a £200 special cop from Bayonne, New Jersey, stole the Golden Glove semi-final show last night with a surprise win over highly favoured Robert the Pistol Listel. In a spectacular sub-novice heavyweight scrap that brought down the house, Webner methodically chopped the pistol with explosive rights and lefts to the head while taking all the punishment the pistol had to offer. So that victory put the surprise package as in Chuck Wetner in the 1964 New York Golden Gloves Heavyweight Novice Championship Final, where he went on to defeat James Sullivan, a police department champion from Staten Island. The fight again was described in the New York Daily News as a sensational fight that was won by a hairline margin. Chuck also claimed a couple of AAU titles and compiled an impressive amateur record of 16 wins and zero defeats. Chuck was a very awkward fighter to watch, but what he lacked in technique he made up for in heart, which made him entertaining to watch. As explained by his friend Johnny D'Isa, the owner of Johnny D's, that's a bar. And he said this of Chuck, he said, he isn't what you would call a natural, but there isn't a stronger man in the ring for my money. If you wanted one word to sum him up, it would be desire. Bert Sugar, the legend, legendary historic boxing reporter, actually said this of Chuck Webner as well. He said, I wouldn't even say he had a style, more a mugger than anything. He was sturdy and tough. With ambitions of turning professional, Chuck needed a manager. And that partnership came about when Webner rescued Al Braverman in a Bronx salon. Now, Al actually explained, he recalled it. He said, I was in the bar, a guy got fresh. I gave him a punch. Two guys come after me. A guy started whacking me. Then a, a stranger, as in Chuck Webner, walked in and took care of the attackers, saying, I didn't like the odds. Al Braverman became his manager from that moment on, and he described Chuck's fighting style, or lack of it. He said he had absolutely no style whatsoever. He had two left feet two left arms and a jaw of granite. After you had hit the guy with your best shot, he's come back for more. People got disgusted hitting him. His best punch was the rabbit punch, the punch to the back of the neck. Absolutely illegal. Chuck even admitted later in life that my three best punches were the chokehold, the rabbit punch and the headbutt. He turned professional on August the 5th, 1964 and scored a three-round knockout of George Cooper at the City Stadium in Bayonne, New Jersey. For his first professional victory on home soil, he was awarded the Gus Lesnovich Memorial Trophy. Just over a week later, and Wepner was fighting once again at Madison Square Garden, where he took a four-round decision to go 2-0. He drew his third fight against Everett Copeland before returning to the Garden and outpointing Jerry Tomasetti to end 1964. On January the 19th, 1965, Webner then took on Ray Patterson, the brother of Floyd, at the Sunnyside Garden. It was a close contest which had Webner reeling in pain after a body shot. However, Ray Patterson made a crucial mistake, as Chuck explained, and he said, he tried to finish me off by going to the head. That's the worst thing he could have done. Hitting me in the head is like hitting a shock absorber. Webner then went on to put Patterson down in the second round en route to a split decision victory. He returned in March to draw with Everett Copeland in their rematch, but then after an eight-month absence from the ring, he slipped up in his seventh professional fight when he lost a close decision to Bob Stallings. Webner was then handed his first real test back at Madison Square Garden, against the then undefeated Buster Mathis, who was 5-0. The United Press International wrote, Mathis floored Webner, 
for an eight count in the opening round and opened a cut over his opponent's right eye later in the session. Wepner was unable to recover from the first round pounding and the fight was stopped by referee Al Lin in the third round. After the fight, Mathis said, you've got to remember, he's a beginner just like me. Wepner maintains that he had never been put down in his professional career and although we were unable to find footage of the fight, you can confirm from many sources that Chuck Wepner definitely hit the deck in the first round against Mathis. Yeah, he does. He, he sort of says that up until the fight with Ali, obviously Ali knocks him down. We'll go into that, but obviously he, he maintains he had never been knocked down. And well, one of those sources was Angelo Dundee, who commented on this topic himself in an interview. And he said that I saw Buster Mathis knock him down a few years back, but don't tell my guy, as in Ali, that he likes being the first to everything. So in 1966, Wepner's contract with Braverman was actually coming to an end. So he signed for a brief time with another manager. And it was very brief because Chuck actually recalled having a good time in a strip club called Ragdoll with a dancer that he actually remembered her name called Shanna. And the new manager had arranged a rendezvous in his office between Chuck and Shanna. And Chuck, who remembered the moment, he said, I came out all sweaty. He had the contract right there and I signed it. So he had this, <laughs> this manager for a very brief time because it was only a few months, in fact, because later on, his new manager was actually convicted with racketeering and Chuck was back working with Al Braverman literally straight after. And he ruled off five victories on the bounce, picking up the vacant USA New Jersey heavyweight title with a fifth round stoppage against Don McAteer on April 28, 1967. And three months later, in a rematch with Jerry Tomasetti, who just seems to love to fight this guy, Wetner was stopped on cuts in the fifth round at Madison Square Garden. However, Chuck got his revenge with a first-round stoppage of Tomasetti on December 68 to end their four-fight rivalry. So a couple of months before that, jumping back again or forward again, Chuck actually stopped Forrest Ward in seven rounds back in the garden again in a real bloody affair by the sounds of it. And Wepner was actually on police duty until 8 a.m. on the day of the fight and went into the fight and put in a very brave performance. And he said, usually after a fight, I just wash my face and go home. But this, hey, this was a, a real pro job, tape and everything in terms of his cuts, getting his face all stitched up. And it was a big win for me, a real big win, he said. And Wepner continued to jump around the club circuit, fighting in them sort of dingy, smoky clubs. On good nights, the, the club would draw in a couple of thousand, but Wepner wasn't concerned. In fact, he thrived off of fighting in these sort of dingy, smoked-out gaffes. And he went on a nine-fight winning streak from November 1967 to April 1969, and he got himself ranked as a heavyweight. His higher ranking earned him a fight in Puerto Rico against Jose Roman. Unfortunately, this step up in class didn't work out and Wepner said, I knocked him down three times and lost a split decision. Now with a record of 18 wins, four losses and two draws, Wepner was given the difficult task of taking on the undefeated Olympic gold medalist George Foreman on August the 18th, 1969 at Madison Square Garden. The Sacramento B row, Wepner, the 221 pound veteran, was hurt by a volley of punches to the head in the second round, then was cut above the left eye later in the round. Foreman split the eye wide open in the third, and the referee, John Colan, stopped the fight at 54 seconds of the third round. Wepner was very disappointed with the referee's decision to stop the fight. He told the press that he bleeds more than that when he brushes his teeth. Now, Kill Clancy was sitting ringside and he agreed, saying, Forrest Ward had Wepner bleeding worse than Foreman did, and they didn't stop it then. Ward just ran out of steam from hitting him. His arm was weary when they stopped it in the seventh. After the defeat, Wepner needed 13 stitches and was on the verge of becoming a stepping stone for the young prospects, with five defeats in 25 fights. Foreman, aged 20 and on the rise, was asked if Wepner hurt him at any point, and he replied, Every time I step into the ring, I hurt. It hurts every time you get hit. Even a baby can hurt you. A year later, Chuck said, George was knocking everybody out. We took that fight because it was a decent payday. He cut me and stopped me early. I never even got started. I was a slow starter anyway. It would take me two or three rounds to really get going. Sometimes you caught cold. 
and you don't really get off, especially against somebody like George. Well, Chuck was back in the ring, even though he required all them stitches. He was back in the ring just four months later and recorded back-to-back victories to end 1969 and begin 1970. Now, after leaving the police force and quitting another security guard job, Wepner's routine consisted of road work in the morning, selling liquor during the day and sparring at night in sweaty clubs of his hometown in Bayonne. Then in the summer of 1970, Chuck was offered a fight against the former world heavyweight champion, Sonny Liston, who actually had a record of 49 and 4 at the time. Now, he recalled sometime after this, he said it was a good chance for me to jump up the rankings, but I really wasn't ready for him. Webner agreed to take 50% of the gate, out of which he he had to pay Liston a guaranteed 13000 plus an extra $3,000 in expenses. He eventually took home $3,900 out of 37,600 gate receipts. So Webner said before the fight, I know I can win. I don't get paid unless the fight draws more than $30,000. So I couldn't be in it for the money. The fight actually took place on June 29, 1970 at the Armory in Jersey City, New Jersey, in front of a crowd of just over 4,000, which included Muhammad Ali as well. And Chuck actually recalled that Ali showed up and he stole the crowd, obviously he would. To say this was a bloody affair, well, this would be a complete understatement. After being cut early and put down in the fifth round, the fight was one-way traffic. The New York Daily News wrote, Chuck started bleeding in the second round and continued to bleed until the end. The fight being stopped at long last between the ninth and the tenth rounds. Now, when it was stopped, Wepner's face was literally covered in blood and his flesh was sliced to ribbons. That's what the New York Daily News wrote. During the break between the ninth and the tenth rounds, this is what Chuck explained, that referee Barney Felix was going to stop the fight. And this is what he said. He said, I said... You ain't stopping nothing. I'm okay. He said, all right, well, how many fingers am I holding up? And I said, how many guesses do I get? Barney Felix allowed the fight to continue with Wepner bleeding profusely and swollen around both eyes, at which point Chuck explains, I couldn't see Liston. All I could see was shadows. I grazed the referee with a left hook in the next round and the doctor stopped it because I was bleeding too much. Al Braverman yelled at the doctor, don't you dare stop it. What the hell's the matter with you? One round, that's all. One round. Chuck said, they let me bleed for five rounds. Why couldn't they give me a chance to win by knockout in the last round? Sitting in the second row that night was Jerry Rosie Rosenberg, a sports editor for the Bayonne Times, who was sprayed with Chuck's blood. The headline the next day read, Bayonne Bleeder loses to Liston. And that's how Chuck Webner got his nickname. He required over 70 stitches after the list and beating, and he admitted later, Sonny was too big and too tough. He broke my nose and gave me 71 stitches and cracked my left jaw. This was Sonny Liston's last professional fight before his death. He said after his 50th win, I would quit boxing if I had another source of income. I hope some promoter can get me Jerry Quarry next. Liston was asked if Wepner was the bravest man he had ever seen, and Sonny said, no. His manager is. He then went on to say, He's got lots of guts. I don't think anyone I ever thought took that kind of punishment. I know I wouldn't have wanted them to let me take what he took. Now the rumour is, Sonny was supposed to take a dive against Webner, But the fight ended up going wrong because Webner got so badly caught, it was actually stopped before Sonny could take a dive. I mean, these are just so many rumours from Liston's life. But once Liston... Liston's earnings were divided up. $10,000 towards his loan was paid out, $3,000 towards his corner men, and then the other three grand was on training expenses. So he was pretty much what he was left with nothing. Sonny Liston not taking a dive is one of many conspiracy theories that led to him losing his life in very suspicious circumstances just over six months later. And Chuck told a, a writer on this list, on Liston's death, um, when it happened, he said, They say Liston was involved with some, how shall I put it, shady characters, and that maybe he was murdered. To be honest, and I don't want to come across as uncaring, I don't know what happened to him and I don't particularly care. 
They say he died of a drug overdose, yet he was afraid of needles. I don't know, he said. Chuck credits Liston as the hardest puncher he ever faced, so harder than George Foreman, he reckons, and that after the Liston fight, I was in a semi-coma. I was in shock. My doctor told my mother I was pretty banged up. I really thought about whether I, I wanted to continue, but then I thought, I've got to try. i just got to try. I've, I've got to give it one more shot. Al Braverman wasn't so sure either. He actually thought this was the right time for Chuck Wepner to quit, and he told him, Chuck, I'm afraid we'll have to pack it in. And then Chuck replied, Oh, look, I love it. I love it too much. Braverman looked at his badly beaten fighter and he said, the cuts, Chuck, they're reality. You can't go on like this. Webner didn't want to pack it in. He was adamant. I got to. Stay with me, he asked. Well, reluctantly, Al Braverman did stay. But then he did say, we'll see. And maybe an operation will help. The operation wasn't actually performed until sometime in 1971. But before that, Chuck realised that the Liston fight had given him a celebrity status. And he said, I started becoming famous and I started liking boxing a little bit better. Chuck then travelled to London just three months after the Liston defeat. He took on the 20-year-old Joe Bugner at the Empire Pool in Wembley for five grand. It would be the same old story for Chuck, as by the end of the opening round, the left side of his face had already begun to show signs of wear and tear. Then midway through the third round, a gash opened above his right eye that almost immediately covered that side of his face with blood. Following the round, referee Harry Gibbs decided to call an end to the fight, despite claims from Wepner's corner to at least give him one more round. By January 1971, Chuck was back in the ring against Jerry Judge and once again, as explained by reporter Bob Curland, in Scranton, Pennsylvania, one Jerry Judge carved up Chuck's face to the tune of 64 stitches. The fight was rightly stopped in the fifth round and Chuck said after his eighth defeat, I just have protruding bone around the eyes. If I get hit enough there, the skin splits. He then said, maybe I'll try one more fight. Bob Curland urged him to stop in his article calling him a decent guy, but let's keep him that way physically. And then writing, if the Bayonne bleeder isn't taken care of here, there's no telling what will happen to him. Chuck finally got his operation after the judge defeat in which the old scar tissue was scraped away and it appeared to have been successful. Until Wepner bleeds again two years down the line. He returned to the ring in September 1971 and recorded two back-to-back -back victories before losing the New Jersey State heavyweight title against Randy Newman on December the 9th, 1971 on points. Interestingly, the New Jersey rules stipulated that the fight had to be competed over 12 rounds, but for only two minutes a round instead of three. Yeah, really weird. It was the one in there their rules, but nevertheless, Chuck was pissed as well with his loss, so much so that he told the Central New Jersey Home News that he's made me a madman. He's a pop-off. He will pay for it all the next time we meet. He was actually given his opportunity on April the 15th, 1972, at the Armoury in Jersey City, and he told the press that he said too many things that disturbed me. He's ridiculed me something awful more than once. I've never in my career as an amateur or pro belittled an opponent. Newman had called Wepner a weakling and a little hitter, apparently, a light hitter, and said that if he didn't knock him out in, in this fight, then he can have his title back. But Wepner admitted that he actually was sick three weeks before their first meeting. and But it, he kept it a secret to himself, as he does. You know, he, he's a bit of a scrapper. And he, he said, I hesitated to tell my manager of my illness for fear he would postpone the fight. I didn't want that because too many people had brought tickets in advance. Chuck then went on to say, I feel like Joe Lewis in his second fight with Max Schmeling. I'm no Lewis, but Randy's no Schmeling either. I predict a KO win, he says. Chuck's father actually sat ringside for this grudge match and he witnessed his 33-year-old son take back the New Jersey State Heavyweight title with a points win and announced his retirement. And he said, he's had enough. Well, of course, Chuck was back out of retirement and ended 1972 with a win before making a defence of his beloved New Jersey heavyweight title in March 1973 against a guy called Billy Marquette. This would be his 39th professional fight. 
and what he counted to be 218 stitches since his debut. He actually told a reporter that, well, what do you think? I'm not a bad body for a guy of 34. My wife loves it, but she says I have to get a head transplant when I retire. I think I would like a Clint Eastwood model or maybe a Paul Newman or one of those pretty other faces. <laughs> Good old Chuck, eh? I've got a great body, but just give me a head transplant. Yeah, you know. <laughs> well, the article written by Fred Kirsch read, For the last nine years, Wepner has been the state champion. Being New Jersey champ means that people wave to him when he makes the rounds on his liquor sales route, and the bar owners say, Throw on an extra case, champ. Sometimes he signs an autograph or two. It is not exactly the top of the world, but it is Wepner's territory, and he guards the title jealously. No punk kid is going to take it away from him. Chuck said, they're finally giving me a belt for the title. A championship belt. I've waited nine years for it. I'm ready. I still get a thrill out of putting on a new pair of trunks, a robe, and stepping into the ring. If anything, I might be a little too sharp. No booze or sex in two weeks. Wepner went on to defend his title successfully with a 12-round points decision and declared that he feared nobody and said, if someone called up and said they had King Kong and he wanted to fight me, I'd tell them to send him over. Godzilla? Yeah, him too. I just love to fight. It's just a great way to stay in good condition and enjoy life. Even though Chuck was being considered as nothing more than a journeyman or a stepping stone for young prospects or former world champions... To get back into contention, he still hoped for his world title opportunity and he said, you know, you never can tell in this business. They've given some real bums a shot at the world title, like Stanner and Daniels. Maybe I'll get a shot someday. I'm waiting for one of those fat paydays. What's a couple of more stitches? In June 1973, another former heavyweight champion, Ernie Terrell, announced that he would fight Chuck Webner on June 23rd at the Convention Center in Atlantic City, New Jersey for the vacant National America heavyweight title. Chuck told the press, I'm grateful to get the chance to fight a man with Ernie's reputation and I'm going to make the most of it. I'm going to win this fight and after that, keep George Foreman in mind for me. Into the fight, and we're, we're going to use the Associated Press account on this because it is, it's a fight, it's a massive fight. For Terrell pounded and bloodied punched as Chuck Webner through most of the fight, billed in New Jersey as being for the American Heavyweight Championship. As in tradition under New Jersey boxing rules, the decision on the fight was made by the referee alone. Known as a cautious fighter, Terrell leaned on Webner throughout the fight and jabbed away at cuts over Webner's right eye and left ear. Now, Al Braverman remembered the fight and he said, so we're in the Ter Ernie Terrell fight and Chuck's ear starts bleeding from a, a rub or something. Just a little thing. He originally got it when uh, Randy Newman bit him there. <laughs> so it starts trickling some and Chuck goes in close and some of it gets on Terrell. Chuck's getting tired and I scream, look, Chuck, Terrell's bleeding. Take it to him. The bum's bleeding. Well, he was so shocked at seeing somebody else bleeding for once that he went on to pick up the biggest win since the operation. And that's exactly what happened. So the referee scored the fight, went the distance. The, the referee scored the fight seven to five in favour of Chuck. But the crowd was stunned by the result, with many having Terrell as the winner. The press corps had it unanimously for the former world champion. Some actually gave him, gave him the fight by as many as 10 out of the 12 rounds. And the official ring magazine scored it 9-3 to Terrell. So you can see he's, it's a, a bit of a bad decision, this one. So much so that Sam Sullivan, who was Terrell's trainer, claimed that he actually saw the referee, Howard Valen, consulting with the promoter, Willie Gilsenberg, when, try, when tallying up his scorecard. And he said that Willie Gilsenberg was telling him to change this round, change that round. Then I asked uh, Gil, Gilsenberg what was going on. And he said, the guy just doesn't know how to add up. Definitely fixing going on there. 100%. Oh, absolutely. 
Lamont Peterson, the man in the hat, Amir Khan. That that's kind of <laughs> yeah. the first thing that springs to mind with me in this situation here in the modern era. Well, Ernie Terrell, of course, was disgusted by saying, "As long as you have people who are cheap in their moral dignity and code of ethics, you will have something that smells like convention hall here tonight." The New York. Jersey State Athletic Commissioner Abe Green acknowledged something fishy when he said, There is nothing I can say to anyone right now, but I'll look into it. He then said, I'll make a careful review of this situation. Two days later, Abe Green announced that he was allowing the decision to stand, but because of the controversy surrounding the decision, he was withholding the title from Chuck Webner and ordering an immediate rematch. Al Braverman stated, The commissioner is not a matchmaker. He does not make fights for my man, Webner said. There is no way I'll get in the ring with Terrell again. If they want me to meet him, they've got to give me my title back. In July, Chuck refused to take the rematch. In August, as demanded by Abe Green, saying his doctor ordered him to take a vacation and his manager Al Braverman was leaving for Japan. The rematch never happened and Chuck remained out of the ring for seven months. During that time, he concentrated on his liquor sales. His boss at Majestic Wines and Spirits said, Chuck's a good salesman and he takes his job very seriously. Chuck himself admitted that he was earning more money outside the ring than inside of it and said, I make a good living. I built up my liquor route from $65,000 to $430,000 in two years. I get a 4% commission. The Lewiston Morning Tribune worked out that between his commission and his take from his fight purse, which he said was approximately $18,000, Webner earned between $25,000 and $30,000 in 1974. It's decent money. It makes you wonder, you know, age of knocking on 35, why on earth would you still be wanting to fight? Well, he did. He, he returned. Um, he was back to winning ways, retaining the uh, New Jersey heavyweight title with a sixth round knockout of Randy Newman at Madison Square Garden and then defended his American honours with a sensational knockout over a guy called Terry Hinkle in a benefit show at Salt Lake City. So Hinkle was actually a stable mate though of the heavyweight champion at the time, George Foreman. And according to Chuck's 15-year-old son and his former friend who's Mr. Farmer, Foreman actually promised Chuck a title shot after he fought Ali in Africa. Now, when Ali won, Chuck was obviously downhearted because he thought that had blown it. He's never going to get his shot now. But soon, gloom would turn into glee. And while sitting at home watching TV, the phone rang, and it was his mum. Wepner's first response was, Mum, I told you never to bother me, (laughs) during Kojak. (laughs) But then his mother asked if he had seen the headlines in the newspapers. That Muhammad Ali, who was 45 and 2 at the time, would be defending his title against a local boxer in the, in the Barrow in the New Jersey area. Chuck did recall actually having a conversation with Don King. And he said, when Ali knocked out Foreman, I said to Don King, do you believe that? I was supposed to fight for the title. And that he said that King had actually promised him a title shot there and then. But he hadn't heard anything back for the best part of three months. So he just probably thought he was just sort of, you know, blowing hot air out. It wasn't until the next morning when, after a sleepless night, obviously, Chuck called Al Braverman, who told him, pack your bags, you're leaving for camp in a few days. Chuck said they they broke it in the newspaper. Ali was with Don King in Cleveland, and he had agreed to fight. So Chuck Webner, a 35-year-old liquor salesman with an unspectacular record of 30 wins, nine losses, and two draws, who had a, a chin of rock, and a face of rice paper was finally given his dream opportunity to fight for the world heavyweight title. Once he accepted the fight, he took a seven-week leave of absence so he could train for his world title bout. A Cleveland business tycoon, Carl Lombardo, put up most of the money for the fight. $1.5 million for Ali and $100,000 for Webner. Not that he complained about the discrepancy. His previous highest purse had been $10,000. For the first time in his career, he could afford to train full-time. He spent eight weeks near the Catskill Mountains under the watchful eyes of his manager, Al Braverman, and his trainer, Bill Present, who said, this will be the biggest surprise in boxing. Webner's second wife, Phyllis, a post office clerk, announced that she would like a Mercedes-Benz if her husband won. A little overwhelmed by the opportunity that had just been presented to him, 
Chuck told Al Braverman, Ali is the king of boxing. And Braverman replied, and you're the king of dirty boxing. You're both royalty. He then made his feelings clear when he said, I'm not in this for money, I'm coming for the title. Although not the number one contender at the time, Chuck was ranked 8th by the Ring magazine and was one of the few in the top 10 who Ali hadn't already faced. It also worked in Webner's favour that he was white because King didn't want Ali to face another black fighter and after the champ had already beaten the other white contenders in Jerry Quarry and George Chevalo, King billed the bout as give the white guy a chance. And Ali initially tried to exploit the racial element during the build-up to the fight. However, Chuck had other ideas and he said he had buttons made up. Give the white guy a break. In those days, it was usually give the black guy a break. He was also trying to get me to use the N-word, which I wouldn't. And years later, he said how he respected that, how I wouldn't go along with making the fight a race fight. I didn't believe it was and I wasn't going to turn the fight into that. No, well, the the title certainly uh, has that. I <laughs> give the white guy a chance. I mean, so nothing could stop the bad press, though. Uh, many felt that Ali was fighting Webner, and it was just a joke. And not even Ali was able to prevent the critics. Even when he he declared that he was going to give all his money to poor black communities as well. Well, many felt the fight was a joke. So Ali stepped up to the plate and he began to sell it. Just his way, the way he, he always does. A reporter asked if Webner was the great white hope. And Ali responded, that's the only hope he's got. Well, asked by another reporter if Webner was representing white America, Ali rolled his eyes and said, white America wouldn't pick him. Then he confidently told the press, I am boxing, not the champion, not just the fighter. I am boxing. The jokes were rife, though, and Ali was at his brilliant best, rolling off a number of great lines. When discussing the amount of times Chuckner had been cut, he said that they should bring Webner to the fight in an ambulance. About Chuck's stitches, he said he's had enough stitches in his face for a couple of dull-knit suits. What Chuck will look like after the fight was another question. After this one's over, he will be an object of art at the National Sewing Club. So Ali then publicly announced he bleeds. So I'm going to make another announcement. There will be no shots landed to his face. I will not land one headshot. I will win this fight by laying on the ropes. Ali continued to say that he'll get tired. He'll punch himself to death. And then I'm going to hit him in the stomach. Hit him in the side. Webner responded to that by saying, Ali won't be able to lean on the ropes against me. And if he expects my arms to come down after a few rounds, he'll be surprised. If he leans on those ropes, I'm going to pick him up and I'm going to throw him out of the ring. (laughs) Well, Chuck admitted, I think Ali is one of the greatest boxers in the game, but I frankly believe he's past his peak and I'm getting a shot at him at a good time. Ali then said, I will beat him without one punch landing here. And he motioned to Chuck's head. I want no excuses about cuts. And Wepner replied, So I bleed a little. What was that stuff all over Rocky Marciano? Water? Don King was asked, what happens if Chuck gets caught and the fight's over before it's even began? He answered, no, God ain't gonna let that happen. I predict he will make a fight with which people, the whole nation, will be proud. Anything can happen when the moment arrives. People have been known to transcend their earthly stature in the middle of the ring. We could have a miraculous happening. Al Braverman was questioned about Webner being a bum and he said, Chuck ain't no bum, could never be one. You can't make a bum out of Webner. Maybe there's a lot of club in him, but he's much more. He may not be the smartest guy in the ring, but he listens. When I'm talking in a corner and a fighter doesn't look in my eyes, I know he's not listening. Then I pull out a piece of his hair or pinch him hard on the thigh. Don't have to do that with Webner. One of the best listeners I've ever had. Chuck explained that less than 2% of all fighters make it to the main events. But he said, I'm here and I'm going in with a damn legend. You know, most people live dull lives, never get a break. But with one punch, I could be a millionaire and my wife wouldn't have to work on the post office night shift anymore. And my name would mean something for a long, long time. Well, Chuck then went on to say that besides, I've never been knocked down in my life. He had twice. 
I don't know why people have been so unkind. I've worked for this shot. Ali wanted to fight somebody white who was ranked. Well, I'm ranked number eight. And I'm about as white as you can get. What's he going to do? Fight Jerry Quarry again? Hell, Quarry wasn't even a competitive fight, competitive against Ali. The one thing Webner had was a granite chin that might help him survive the distance, which would have been an achievement in itself. He explained to the Philadelphia Inquirer about his granite chin, his cuts, and what it would take for him to win. And he, he actually said this. So this is on why he had never been knocked out either as well. So this is, this is him explaining all to all these questions. He said, see this? Grabbing his thick neck. He said, I call this my shock absorber. There are nerves in the back of my neck, see? And they go up to your brain. Those nerves, see? They're the ones that carry the message to your brain that you've been KO'd. So tell your body to get ready to lay down. But I got such a neck, see, my head don't snap back too much when I get punched. Those nerves don't get the message. So maybe a guy belts me pretty good, but my brain never gets told. So that's his explanation. Trouble was, he wasn't called the Bayon Bleeder for nothing. His chin was solid, but his skin was like tissue paper. And that didn't bother Chuck, though. He said... When I'd get cut, I'd be in the corner and I'd say, Al, can you see the back of my head through it? If he says that he couldn't, then I'd keep fighting. The only chance Chuck had was to land one lucky punch. And he said, one is all it takes, like Al told me. He said, you want to be an instant millionaire? Then hit him with one shot so hard he falls and he stays. He don't get up. Do that, Chucky. And it's going to make up a whole lot of hurting. The huge underdog then laid down the gauntlet and said, it's going to be a gang war. I don't think a conventional fighter could ever take him. I'm 6'5", 222 pounds, and he's going to know he's been in with all of it. Braverman added his two pennies in when he said, I'll tell you this, he gets past eight or nine rounds, Ali could be in trouble. I think he's taking Chuck way too lightly, and from what I hear, Ali is in the worst shape of his career. The Bayonne Bars and its residents were behind their hometown hero and hung out good luck Chuck signs. At the Churchill Inn, patrons were invited to drink a special concoction called the Hammer in honour of Chuck Wepner, who sold his liquor in their bar. The sign behind the bar read, One shot and you're out. Owner of the Churchill Inn and Chuck's friend Mr Farmer told the New York Times, Throw the referee out of the ring and I'll take Chuck. A patron then chimed in and said, in fact, if you leave out the referee, you can put Fraser and Foreman in there too, and we'll still take Webner. The fight took place on March the 24th, 1975, and the agreed venue was the Coliseum in Ohio, which was built in 1974 on farmland outside the village of Richfield, Ohio, and was opened by Frank Sinatra. It certainly wasn't Zaire, but it was the perfect venue for Chuck to pull off an upset, especially because he now felt so confident. He even wrote a poem for Ali, which he read out at the pre-fight press conference called Goodbye Ali, Hello Chuck. And this is the poem. I know they say you're the greatest to ever wear the crown. And that, this is a fight of little renown. But tomorrow night you are going to run out of luck. There will be a new champion. And his name will be Big Chuck. So, uh, Wepner remembered the night before the biggest fight of his career. He said, Night before the fight, the owner of the Coliseum invites me and Ali to his private box for dinner. A big table, and I'm sitting right next to Ali. A couple of hours sat together talking, and he did a few magic tricks. I loved it. I loved Ali. We became great friends. This is before the fight. Well, on the night of the fight, Reporters sitting ringside were actually given red anoraks to wear in anticipation of Wepner spilling his blood all over him. Before the fight, a reporter asked Wepner if he thought he could survive in the ring with the champion, to which Wepner allegedly answered, I've been a survivor my whole life. If I survive the Marines, I can survive Ali. Well, after James Brown stumbled through and pretty much murdered the national anthem by all accounts, forgetting most of the words, the fight was finally ready to begin. When the two faced off before the opening bell, 
Ali said to Wepner, I'm going to kick your ass, you honky motherfucker. Wepner responded, go for it, you motherfucker. As Chuck walked back to his corner, he actually started laughing to himself. I said to myself, what did I just say to Ali? Did I just call Ali a motherfucker? I can't believe I said that, but I was so hyped. From the get-go, Wepner was landing rabbit punches and Ali complained throughout, but dished out several rabbit punches back in return. Ali was in control of the first eight rounds, but then everything changed in the ninth and Wepner explained. So I was pressing him as usual, trying to slip jabs, which wasn't easy because he used to double and triple it. But Al says to me, yeah, he throws that jab, but he's getting lazy, Chuck. Look to slip under the jab and hit him with a punch. And that's just what I did. I threw a jab and pulled it back slowly and I hit him right under the heart with a good right hand. And he went down. Many, including Ali, have suggested that Wepner stood on his foot. And that's why he went down. But the referee, Tony Perez, judged it to be a legitimate knockdown. Wepner argued, foot or not, I landed a big right hand shot below his heart. And that's what put him down. Wepner then recalled, he fell backward and went under the bottom rope. I went back to the corner and I said, Al, start the car. We're going to the bank. We're millionaires. Al said to me, Chuck, you better turn around. He's getting up and he looks pissed off. I turned around and he had a shocked look on his face and Drew Bundini Brown was going nuts. What the hell's wrong with you? What are you doing? This whitey is kicking your ass. Get in there. He was screaming the whole fight. From then on, Ali dominated the fight and Wepner remembered. I could see his eyes and I thought, I've really got him angry now. That's when he started counter-punching and swearing at me. He continued to describe his version of, of how the fight played out and he said, By the 13th round, my legs were starting to give out on me a little bit. I was getting tired in my legs and I remember after the 14th round, I come back to the corner just before the 15th and I said to Al, take my mouthpiece out. I was going to fight the last round without a mouthpiece to help me breathe more. And Al says, I'm not doing that. Leave your mouthpiece in and just go out and do the best you can do. He says, you've just got one more round to go. Ali had given Wepner a working over for most of the fight, but especially from the ninth round on. <laughs> just I got in the middle of knocking Ali down. I just it's brilliant, isn't it? <laughs> Start the car, Al. We're, we're millionaires. Love that. That's brilliant. Well, we then uh, uh, Ali obviously then went on to drop the challenger as in Chuck Wepner in the fifteenth for final round, and Wepner confirmed he caught me with a punch off my left shoulder and the side of the head. It wasn't a solid punch, but my legs were weak. They were wobbly, and I went down. And I remember the ref counting. I pulled myself up on the top rope. Tony Perez looked to my eyes, and he asked if I was okay. I said yes, but he waved on. We waved off the fight with 19 seconds to go. Now, by the end of the fight, the crowd, who was just shy of 15,000, went from chanting "Ali, Ali," to now shouting "Chuck, Chuck, Chuck." So. But Sugar says he explains it. He said he was just this bouncer gone good. He gave hope and heart to the idea of any man, any man could make it. So that was what Bert said. You can't help but feel disappointed for Chuck, though. He had done a valiant effort, had a a great fight to his credit. But he was out on his feet and was probably the right call, even though it was only 90 seconds to go, because he probably could have got really knocked out and hurt. Chuck obviously wasn't so understanding with the decision for Perez to stop the fight. He said, later on, I was angry that he called it, it called it into the fight. But at the end, but at that time, I was so damn tired. I didn't realise what he did. I more or less stumbled over the to the corner and I said, what happened? What happened? And Al said, he stopped the fight, Chuck. Perez explained that I couldn't let that man take another punch. He might have killed him if I had have let him take one more punch. Ali admitted that I didn't carry him because people mentioned that he was carrying Chuck and he's better than you all thought. He's a good awkward fighter. I was surprised he didn't go down either, but I finally got him away. When he said that, a female voice shouted from the back of the press room. No, you didn't. Someone from Ali's entourage told the woman to be quiet and shut up. And and Ali responded. He said, nah, that's Chuck's wife. She's got a right to say what she wants. I know when I lost to Ken Norton, my my wife karate chopped five policemen leaving the ring. Wives don't like their husbands to lose. 
Asked if he was disappointed with the stoppage, Wepner replied, of course, but you know what? I went 15 rounds with Muhammad Ali. Not too many people did that. Then asked what he would do if he got a rematch with Ali, and he said, I'd duck a little more. Chuck said in another interview, I'm still proud of what I accomplished. I was the only guy to knock him down when he was the champion of the world. Muhammad Ali praised his challenger's efforts and said, there's not another human being in the world that can go 15 rounds like that. Angelo Dundee said he used every trick in the book against Muhammad, including trying to kick him with his right leg. You've got to give that guy some credit. Someone asked Wepner how many stitches he got after the fight, and Wepner's response was as classic as ever. All the cuts only took 23 stitches. Two over the left eye, one over the right. One didn't need any. No deep cuts. The doctor was very thorough, and he told me, the only thing is, your nose is broken. And I told him, don't worry about that. This is the fifth time. It's just silly putty now. It's just cartilage now. Well, unfortunately for Chuck, he had promised his wife that he would become the world champion when he returned to their hotel suite that night. He even bought her some very sexy powder blue negligee and told her, wear that to bed tonight, honey. You're going to be sleeping with the heavyweight champion of the world. When he arrived at the hotel later that night, Mrs. Webner was sat on the edge of the bed wearing the sexy powder blue negligee and she said, okay, big shot, is the champ coming to my room? Or am I going to his? <laughs> brilliant. I oh, love Phyllis. Uh, what, what a brilliant quote that is for Phyllis. <laughs> uh, just every time it gets me. Uh, brilliant stuff. So one promise that Chuck did give to his wife was that fame would come from boxing, especially after the Ali fight. And he told her, even if I don't win, I want to prove that I belong here. Well, we sort, we sort of did by going, we should have gone a distance, but it, it weren't to be. But however, Chuck went straight back into work, selling liquor as well, straight after the fight. He would go into the bar of a client, buy a round for the house and two for himself, and then proclaim, if the fight had been in a phone booth, I'd be the heavyweight champion of the world. Well, not only was the Ali fight important, for Chuck Webner's celebrity status that had gone from local fame to now world fame. But it was also the night that inspired a spectator watching on closed circuit television in a movie theater. The struggling actor and screenwriter rushed home to sketch out a character for a new screenplay he had in mind. After just three and a half days, he created a story about an over the hill club fighter fighting for the heavyweight championship of the world and turning the crowd into his favour. The movie went on to become the highest grossing film of 1976 and a winner of three Oscars in 1977. It was a career launch pad for a creator and actor, Sylvester Stallone, who was motivated by Webner's bravery, which encouraged him to create the character Rocky Balboa. He would, of course, go on to produce the famous and well-loved Rocky movie franchise. Apparently, Webner was actually consulted about the movie, but he thought that it would flop. So he was actually offered a, a flat fee, but we'll go into that later on in the episode. Now, by the time the movie was released on December the 3rd, 1976, word had spread that Webner was Stallone's inspiration and Webner relished in the glory of hearing his name chanted in the New York theatre where he watched the film. In fact, he saw the film three times and he said, I was in complete awe. It was me. We will revisit the Rocky movies as we move on with the story, but for now, let's go back to Chuck's story. Now, he returned to the ring in November 1975 and won three straight fights by knockout. Then in 1976, Don King and Vince McMahon Sr. of the World Wide Wrestling Federation saw an opportunity to earn more money by mixing boxers with wrestlers. On June 25, 1975, at New York's Shea Stadium, the 6'5", 230-pound Chuck the Bayonne brawler, Webner, faced the 7'4", 450-pounder, Andre the Giant, in a pro wrestling car dubbed Showdown at Shea. Both competitors earned a decent 25 grand. However, in the main event between Muhammad Ali against Antonio Inoki, which took place at the Budokan Hall in Tokyo, Ali took home $6 million. 
but Chuck wasn't bothered and he said, I will fight anyone for the money. The two wrestler versus boxer matches were marketed under the banner of War of the Worlds and were shown live on closed circuit television across the US and internationally including in Canada and the UK. Immediately after Showdown had concluded, the New York crowd of almost 33,000 were able to watch Ali vs. Enoki live on a three-sided video screen placed on the baseball infield. The rules for the match were Andre could execute anything in his pro wrestling armoury, but would have to release Wepner and any hold applied whenever the boxer touched the ring ropes. Wepner would wear boxing gloves and would throw punches as his only strikes. The bout was scheduled for 10 three-minute rounds, with the referee and judges all keeping scorecards. The possible outcomes were pinfall, submission, knockout, TKO, decision, draw, countout or disqualification. Now, of course, the fight was a fake. It was choreographed, but many were thoroughly entertained by it. Both men would jab and parry and hold for the first couple of rounds, and the New York Times reported Wepner was a baby against the Giant. Well, in the third round, Andre head headbutted Chuck and then tossed him from the ring where Wepner was counted out. Rather than give Wepner the 20 seconds to get back into the ring, as in professional boxing, when a fighter falls out of the ring, referee John Lewis started the standard pro wrestling 10 count. And a melee ensued around Wepner, which included Gorilla Monsoon and Wepner's manager, Al Braverman. But Wepner and Braverman later claimed that Monsoon put his foot on Wepner's chest in an effort to keep the boxer from getting up off the ground. Of course, this is all just choreographed, as you said. Now, while Wepner was still down, the bell rang, which gave Andre the victory at 1 minute and 17 seconds of round three via the 10 count. Now, the fight ended controversially with the aim of having them have fight a rematch. But of course, they never did. The New York Daily News quoted both men in their next day story on the match with Wepner saying, I'd figured I'd work on his stomach. He hit me with an illegal shot. I could beat him. And Andre countered by saying, I could have knocked him out in the first round, but he kept holding the ropes. Now, this is probably a good time to mention that Sylvester Stallone clearly, clearly stole this idea from Chuck Wepner's life in Rocky III which was released six years later. He actually, it it featured a similar sequence where Rocky Balboa participated in a charity match against, obviously, the wrestler Thunderlips, who was played by Hulk Hogan. Like in the Wepner andre fight, the wrestler tossed the boxer out of the ring. The only difference was that Rocky crawled back into the ring and throws Thunderlips out. The bout ended in a Hollywood-friendly draw, whereas the fame that came from this epic defeat to Ali his association with the Rocky movie, his fight with the eighth wonder of the world, diverted Wepner's life onto a new path. His next move was to fight a bear. Yet you heard right, Chuck Wepner will fight a bear. But not just once, he fought a bear twice. Well, the bear's name was Victor, or rather Victor the Wrestling Bear. Now, this was the 70s, so animal cruelty just wasn't as frowned upon. But poor Victor was declawed, defanged, fitted with a muzzle and drugged out of his mind. Even still, he could throw down someone who stood before him. And apparently, he even knew a few professional wrestling moves as well. A man called Tuffy Truesdell had helped Victor compile a ridiculous record of 1,500 wins and no defeats. However, there is a catch. Victor the Bear was a franchise with as many as four Victors in circulation. They always had a white V painted on their fur. They fought men and women in bars, clubs and on beaches all over America. Well, a nightclub owner called Artie Stock, who owned the Royal Manor Club in New Jersey, offered Wepner a fight against Victor for good money, and Wepner accepted. Chuck would take on two different versions of Victor, and in Al Braverman's opinion, it was the second bear that was the best boxing bear he had ever seen. The first Victor that Wepner fought weighed between 400 and 800 pounds, depending upon which sources you want to use for that information, and Wepner told the British television and radio sport pundit Steve Bunce, It must have been £450, Wepner recalled. 
I was told not to hit the bear. What was I supposed to do? Tell the bear a story? The bear wanted to kill me. The first fight with Victor went badly and he said, I was hitting the bear with jabs, hooks and the bear was starting to get crazy. Then it got me and threw me 15 feet up in the air. People said I put on a great show and I said, are you out of your mind? This bear tried to kill me. So the original plan was for Chuck to signal the bear's trainer, Tuffy, when he had had enough. At which point he would blow a whistle and Victor would back off. Trouble was, Webner fought hard, resulting in the bear throwing Chuck across the ring and pinning him down so he couldn't signal to Tuffy. Now, the irony of this animal cruelty is that the first fight with Victor was in aid of the Make-A-Wish Foundation, believe it or not. Webner had a rematch with Victor at the County Club charity event and worked out a strategy with Al Braverman so he could win this fight. Now, when Chuck got into the ring, he described what happened next. He said, I'm sitting in the corner and I'm looking over at this bear sitting there and it's beady eyes, little eyes. And I said to Al, this bear remembers that I hit him a few times. I'm telling you, this bear's pissed off of me. But Al says, forget that. There's no way this bear can remember you. I said he did and he knew what I would do. I had to change my tactics. The bear had done his own work for this rematch, he said. <laughs> well, poor Chuck Webner, who wasn't the sharpest tool in the toolbox, didn't realise it was a completely different bear altogether. But he continued with his story. He said, the bell rang. The bear stood up on its hind leg and I spun around, tried to jump out between the ropes and the bear took one leap, grabbed my leg and then pulled me. I got caught up in the ropes and he slung me out about 10, 12 feet onto a dinner tables and everything went splat. Two of my buddies picked me up and said, come on, Chuck, get him. I looked at the ring. The referee was counting. The bear was standing there. I was He was up to four and I said, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. And that's it. You win, Victor. It's, uh, it's, you know what? I'm laughing. It's a funny story, but, <laughs> it's but terrible, it? let's be honest. It's quite terrible. The fact what they were doing to these bears, I think that's quite wrong, to be honest. Like just because it was the seventies and it wasn't frowned upon then, like the story is quite unbelievable. Uh, although it's true, but it's, it's really harsh what they did to these bears, man. Like it's, it's really sad to yeah. be honest with you, but you can just imagine Chuck Webner, can't you? Like, it's just like he he he'd fight. He said he'd fight anyone for money. He, he didn't specify if he'd fight anything for money. And in this instance, he fights the bear. Well, he continued this story, and he said, "And that was it. I didn't even get back in the ring. The fight lasted less than a minute." Now, after spending some time away from the boxing ring, Chuck returned on October the second, nineteen seventy six, and was stopped in the sixth round on cuts against the undefeated Dwayne Bobick. He travelled to South Africa in February of 1977 and Wepner remembered. I fought Mike Schutte, who was then the South African champion outside Johannesburg and I had him draped over the ropes in the ninth round and out on his feet when the lights suddenly went out. By the time they came back on, Schutte had recovered and they gave him the split decision. He lost again two months later by a 10th round stoppage after being knocked down in the last round against Hort Geisler. Now, with boxing not going too well, he decided to get back in the wrestling ring in October of 1977 against Japanese wrestler Antonio Inoki in Tokyo. In the main event of the 1977 Martial Arts Second Championship at the Budokan Hall, Wepner said after his loss, Inoki is fast and good. For a wrestler, he throws a mean punch. Chuck was now 39 and coming to the end of his boxing career. He fought three more times in 1978, winning two and losing his last to Scott Frank, and with it, the New Jersey State heavyweight title. Following the defeat, he said, I held the Jersey Championship for 16 years. I lost the title to Scott Frank, who was 20 years old. I remember that Scott, when he was 12, he used to come down to the gym and watch me train. When you lose to an ex-12-year-old, that's it. <laughs> Now, he didn't retire straight after the defeat. He announced his actual retirement in October of 1979 and was honoured by Madison Square Garden. And he said, They threw a retirement dinner for me. They honoured me in a couple of testimonial dinners in New Jersey. But I never expected the Garden to honour me. 
especially after losing to an ex 12 year old. <laughs> uh, the, uh, the other main contributing factor to for Chuck retiring wasn't just his age and losing to Scott. He said it was because of the plastic surgery that he had on his nose in the spring of 1979. He said it cost me $4,400. I'm not going to take a chance and fight again. I can breathe better and it's straight. People say I look like Debbie Reynolds <laughs> from the side. He then said when I retired, I became a sex symbol. My stable of girls increased from three to five. Now, his love of women was never a secret. And he told a reporter in the September of 1979, he said, the public knows about me and my girlfriends. I date about 10, three or four steady. 95% are foxes and the other 5% are not super, but they're still good looking. Three of the girls are college grads, opposites attractor. So there you go. He's <laughs> not going to fault. He's not going to have college grads. Oh dear. In 2003, Chuck spoke to the New Jersey record about one girl he was dating in the late 70s and early 80s. He said, I used to date a girl, had a horse out on Staten Island. What's that stable? You know what they say about fiery redheads? This one was a real whack job. I woke up one morning, she had a gun pointed at my face and she says she's going to kill me. I say, honey, put down the gun. I say, honey, you've got to get off the booze and get the help you need. <laughs> In the same interview, he said, don't get me wrong, I love women. I think they're the most beautiful and loveliest creatures God put on this earth. But I've had a lot of trouble with women, a lot of whack jobs out there. Well, Chuck Webner finished his boxing career with a record of 36 wins, 17 of those coming by way of knockout, 14 losses, two draws, and according to Chuck himself, a total of 338 stitches in a 15-year career. I wonder how many uh, women he had in that 15-year career as well. I wonder <laughs> if it adds any, anywhere near up to the 338 stitches that he had. <laughs> well, Chuck admitted in 1979 that he had a side job where he solved problems for people who were owed money. Chuck said, let's say I did a couple of favours for friends of mine, you know. I used to go around and ask people politely about the money they owed, and then maybe I have to smack them in the face or something. It was basically a muscle man for loan sharks. He confessed to doing this line of work for nine years, but declared I was lousy at it. I was like Rocky. I didn't like messing people up. In the film The Brawler, Chuck is portrayed as a muscle man for one of the scariest mobsters in New York, Joey G, a.k.a. Joseph Gallo, or otherwise known as Crazy Joe. Although the film was based on Chuck's life story, there will of course be moments that are made up. However, Chuck does confirm that later on in this episode that the producers used confidential information to create the movie about his life. So it could be true that he did work for Joey G at some point. Chuck's voice was narrated at its beginning where he says, One of my favourite side jobs was collecting for a mobster named Joey G. The mob was a mean to an end. Something to pay the bills. But I knew I didn't want to get him mixed up in that crazy shit. In retirement, Chuck was a frequent visitor in the clubs and partied hard. And he admitted, you get caught up in partying and celebrity life and you do a lot of stupid things. Chuck was single after being divorced twice and had three children. And he said, the trouble with kids is they don't have character. I don't regret being poor. Kids now are spoiled. They get everything. Parents bring them up wrong. That's why they're involved in dope, stealing and other drugs. Well, the irony is, uh, speaking of drugs, while partying hard, Chuck began to use cocaine and a lot of it by the sounds of things. It was his addiction that resulted in him failing an audition to appear in Rocky II. Now, he should have been preparing for the audition by rehearsing his lines for the part of Chink Webber, a sparring partner for Rocky Balboa, Chuck and his best friend John went skinny dipping with some ladies and snorted lines instead of rehearsing them. When he showed up extremely late for the audition, he was as high as a kite and he stunk of booze. Because he was so high, he struggled to get through the scene with Stallone and as expected, his scene was cut from the film. Now, according to Wepner, St Stallone had actually promised him that when the right time came along, he would give Chuck a part in one of his films. In November 1979, Chuck did fight Muhammad Ali again. 
but for the American Dental Association films, like an advert, a commercial, where he played the part of Mr. Tooth Decay. And he said, whenever I knocked Ali down, he ran off to brush his teeth. We spent three, three days together. He's like a big child, always giggling and joking. That's a great way to be if you can. From the mid-1970s to the mid-80s, Chuck's cocaine habit escalated badly. And he admitted, I was this big celebrity, making appearances, making good money. A good couple of friends of mine had clubs and I'd hang around in them. In that era, everyone was doing cocaine. Nobody wanted to drink anymore. I became addicted socially. I used to do it Thursday, Friday, Saturday and didn't do it early in the week because I was working and I didn't have to do it. I did it because everywhere I went, it was the thing. Then on Friday the 8th, 1985, the New York Times reported, Chuck Wepner was arrested yesterday in New Jersey on charges he conspired to distribute cocaine. Alan Rockoff, the Middlesex County prosecutor, said Wepner was arrested following an eight-month investigation by his office that included the Federal Drug Enforcement Agency, also known as the DEA, the Hudson County Prosecutor's Office and several police departments. Rockoff said Wepner, 46, was a mid-level dealer of cocaine who had connections with sources in New York City where the police were continuing to investigate the case. Wepner was arrested in Sayerville, where authorities found four ounces of cocaine with an estimated $12,000 street value in his car. Rockoff said six to seven more grams were found in his pants pocket. Wepner was being held on $75,000 bail and was scheduled to be formally arraigned on Tuesday, November the 12th. Rockoff said, Wepner was charged with possession of cocaine, possession with intent to distribute cocaine and conspiracy. A search warrant was issued on his residence and they found $3,200 and three unregistered handguns. The LA Times stated that a prosecutor said following his arrest, police also arrested another man and a woman to whom Wepner was allegedly supplying drugs. The assistant Middlesex County prosecutor, Ron Cacado, said that authorities had wiretaps on Webner's telephone and had occasionally kept him under surveillance. Cacado said his Bayonne townhouse, the same where he lived as a kid, was used as a storage point for cocaine. Cacado explained that the Hudson County and Bayonne authorities were not informed of the investigation of Webner until after his arrest when county investigators assisted with a search of his house. Cacado also said this, conviction on the charges carries a maximum penalty of life in prison. The Jersey Journal explained, Middlesex County have been investigating cocaine sales for eight months, but authorities hadn't started investigating Wepner until two months ago. Wepner's arrest took place on a traffic circle in Sayerville, where investigators had followed Wepner on his way to make a drug delivery. Well, officers believed that he was preparing to meet his source for more cocaine, a man identified as Gustav Grill of Staten Island, New York. Cocado said Grill, however, was never found. The Jersey Journal wrote on Wednesday, November the 13th, that Wepner was released and spoke to Al Serto, the Hudson County boxing promoter, who said, the world's gone crazy. It's like a local priest was selling dope. It's pretty hard to believe. A representative of the paper actually went to speak with Chuck. Although he didn't shy away here and he actually even apologised for not giving a full interview, he did say my lawyers had told me not to talk. Tony Cobone, a former boxer who wept and managed, obviously when he retired, said that he drank, sure. He always had the pretty ladies on his arm, but I've seen girls offer him pot and he'd make a big fight. Tony Cabone then dropped another bombshell and when he said that Chuck had a tumour removed from his chest in August, polyps removed from his throat five years ago and that he had a benign tumour in his chest. Other friends told the press that he had suffered from cancer, had lost both parents to cancer in recent years and that he missed the limelight of the big time boxing. Webner had kept news of his cancer quiet from the press, 
but most of his friends were aware of it. Most of which were more shocked about the arrest than his cancer. Al Braverman was one who prayed that it was a misunderstanding. I'll go to Shaw and say a little prayer for him and hope he gets off. Then on March 28, 1986, the Central New Jersey Home News wrote, the grand jury charged Wepner, Grill and two others, Natalie Weinstein, 41, and Ralph Devon Jr., 24, with conspiracy to distribute cocaine between September the 5th and November the 9th, 1985. Wepner and Devon could face life in prison if convicted because they were charged with dealing in high-grade pure cocaine in amounts greater than one ounce. In addition to the conspiracy charge, Wepner was indicted for possession of cocaine in Bayonne and Sayerville and possession of the drug in Sayerville with intent to distribute on November the 8th, 1985. Weinstein was indicted for possession of cocaine and Valium and possession with intent to distribute. Police reported finding cocaine valued at $5,000 in Weinstein's home. On August 30th, 1987, Michael Katz wrote this for the New York Daily News. The Middlesex County in New Jersey are offering Chuck a deal. 3 to 12, Chuck said. That's a minimum before I'd even get up for parole. And to take that deal, he'd have to talk. The 48-year-old former heavyweight champion of New Jersey may be a lot of things. Rat isn't one of them. Wepner said, They want you to talk about people you know. I can't do that. These are friends of mine. Maybe they did something wrong, but I can't talk. He then said in another interview, No one likes a rat. Three days after I was busted, they came in offering me a deal if I gave some names. No bleeping way. His friends left him holding a bag. The cops said the bag contained four ounces of cocaine. Friends say Wepner just got caught up with the wrong crowd. A friend of Chuck said he couldn't have needed money. He was making 60, 70 grand a year selling liquor. And if he had anything to do with coke, it was probably just to impress women. Chuck then went on to say in the same article, I represent the people of New Jersey and I would never do anything to bring dishonour to the state. I've never been arrested never been picked up drunk. I've never even got a speeding ticket. Well, although his lawyers had told him not to discuss the trial two years after the bust, he said that some of his friends must have ratted on him. He said, right now, all it is, is an indictment. And an indictment is only an accusation. Meanwhile, each month that rolls by, there's a new bill in terms of paying his lawyers. The lawyers have cost him $35,000 already, he said. He still hopes the case is thrown out, maybe because the cops broke rules. He said, we think there may have been an illegal wiretap and uh, the search warrant was uh, shaky. So that, that's what it looked shaky. That's what he said. Well, on December the 17th, 1987, the Central New Jersey Home News reported Chuck Wepner pleaded guilty in Superior Court to reduce a drug possession charge. Wepner, 48, said his addiction to cocaine drove him to conspire to sell drugs to two local residents. In the morning of the hearing before, Judge Joseph F. Deegan Jr., Wepner pleaded guilty to charges of possession and consp conspiring to sell illegal drugs. By pleading guilty to the charges, the Middlesex County Prosecutor's Office agreed to enter a plea bargain agreement with Wepner under which the maximum prison term would be reduced from life in prison to 10 years in prison. Wepner, who will probably be sentenced in February, could also receive a shortened sentence probation or community service. Wepner read from a brief prepared statement as he entered the guilty plea he said for a period of several months during the fall of 1985 I'll become involved in the use of cocaine. Wepner was released on continuation of his bail until his sentencing hearing. Now on his way out of the courtroom Wepner said he was no longer addicted to cocaine but declined to answer any other questions. He said, I've been over my problem for quite a while. The attorney of the former boxer, Justin P. Walder, said Wepner's involvement with drugs should send a lesson to young people. He certainly feels guilt-ridden 
and certainly acknowledges his wrongdoing. Walder said use of cocaine began around the time he was set to undergo cancer surgery in the summer of 1985. The other two individuals who were indicted, Devone and Weinstein, also pleaded guilty earlier in the year. Devone was sentenced to prison for seven years and Weinstein got six months. On March 16, 1988, the Central New Jersey Home News broke the verdict. Charles Chuck Wepner was sentenced to 10 years in prison. Superior Court Judge Joseph F. Deegan Jr. said imprisonment in Wepner's case was necessary for the protection of the public and to let those in the drug world know society will not tolerate the continuing infestation of drugs into its fabric. Wepner will become eligible for parole in slightly under two years. One year, 11 months and 8 days. But he would not necessarily be paroled at that time, according to authorities. As his girlfriend wept while embracing Wepner after the judge left the bench, the burly defendant told her, Sorry honey, I didn't think it would be that bad. After imposing the sentence, Deegan revoked Wepner's $75,000 bail. Later, as he was being moved from Middlesex County House with other prisoners, Wepner was heard telling other handcuffed defendants they might have a good boxing team in prison. Wepner's lawyer, Justin Walder, tried to convince the court that his defendant was addicted to coke and asked for leniency. However, Assistant Middlesex County Prosecutor Ronald Cacado claimed that Wepner had told an officer that he had been living the high life and selling cocaine and was supporting that lifestyle. The wiretap also confirmed to have been approved, which was even more incriminating for Wepner. The court heard officers arranged to buy 3.6 grams of cocaine for $8,000. They then learnt that Wepner would be making the delivery. While on his way to make the drop, Wepner was pulled over and arrested. 10 years, wow. It seems harsh, but it went from bad to even worse for Chuck in only his first night in prison when a fellow inmate, obviously not knowing who he was, decided to test the water with the big man. Chuck recalled that no one gave him any trouble except for this one guy. He said, one inmate tried the first day I got there. He said that if I bought him cigarettes every week, I wouldn't get hurt. Obviously, he didn't know who I was or else he wouldn't have said such a stupid thing. So by way of introduction, I slapped him across the face, jammed his head against the cell bars and threw him around for a while. We became good friends after that. <laughs> However, it also earned, earned him a trip to solitary confinement for a few days as well following that. Where most men would have struggled with prison, Chuck, he just took it in his stride. And when asked if his time was hard, he said, give me a break, it was fine. Everywhere I went, the guys were singing, champ, champ, and saying to me, how you doing, Chuck? You know, I was with the right people in prison, you might say. I wound up in a unit with some some of the guys from the neighbourhood. I knew them and they knew me, so he found it quite easy. In 1989, while serving his time at the East Jersey State Prison in New Jersey, Chuck had an unexpected visitor. A certain Sylvester Stallone arrived. The actor spent two days shooting the film Lockup at Chuck's prison and requested a meeting with him. And Chuck actually said this to the Latino Review. He said, but I actually did go down to see Stallone when he came to the jail to do lockup. The warden came in to get me and said, Chuck, he's here, he's here. And I said, who? And he said, Sylvester Stallone, he's here. Going to film parts of his movie here. Let's go down and see him. We went down to see him and Stallone gave me a hug and said, Chuck, is there anything I can get you? And I said, yeah, how about a rope ladder? The warden <laughs> laughed, but the captain of the guard said, don't be a wise ass. I watched them filming and the next day he finished his shots and that was it. He personally filmed it there because he knew I was in jail there. He could have picked any one of 10 prisons. After volunteering to run the prison boxing team, a venture that he said failed because of lack of talent, Chuck was finally released from Newark's Northern State Prison in March of 1991 after serving nearly three years. When he got out of prison, he thought he'd be rejected by his Bayonne faithful but it was the opposite. They embraced him. Allied Liquors welcomed him back and Wepner reconnected with Linda, a woman he had dated 15 years earlier and they actually went on to get married in 1994 
and Linda said, I liked Chuck years ago, but I didn't share it. He's a little older now, and he has passed the test. He's made some mistakes, but they're all behind him. And his reward? Well, he's got me. A year later, Chuck told the New Jersey record, I took a lot of shots, but I'm still in pretty good shape. I get around, and I'm a pretty literate guy. I can still put two and three sentences together at the same time. Then, just shy of ten years later, and Chuck Wetman decided that it was time to sue Sylvester Stallone for compensation on the grounds that the actor had continued to use his identity to promote the Rocky franchise. He was seeking $15 million in damages, which was nothing, absolutely nothing, compared to what the movies had made over the years. Well, by this point, the Rocky series, or franchise, whatever you want to call it, had spawned four sequels, the five of which earned just more than $1 billion. Now, while Wepner said in 2003 that he never got a dime nothing that wasn't entirely true he was offered a flat fee for the story of rocky or one percent of the gross but he took the flat fee saying you know me a bird in the hand the bird was reported seventy thousand dollars the gross on the rocky series is now reported one billion and one percent and that was 10 million quid so uh, it's all 10 million dollars Chuck felt like Stallone had taken too many liberties and he told the Philadelphia News, I like the guy. He had done a wonderful job with the Rocky movies. I just thought that somewhere along the line, he would do something for me the way he said he would. But that was that just never happened. And it has become a personal insult to me at this point. I'm very disappointed in him because I like him. He is a likable guy, but enough is enough. Come on, Sly. So Webner, now 64 years of age, said the final straw was in 1997 when Stallone was shooting Copland, not far from Bayonne, and did not offer him even a small part in the film. He said, I I stopped by the set and he halted the production. He said, hey everyone, Chuck Webner's here. He called over De Niro and said, Bob, meet Chuck Webner. Long story short, he told me, don't worry Chuck, I'll be in touch with you. So what happened? Nothing again. The Philadelphia News spoke with his attorney, Anthony Mango, who said whenever Stallone would see him, he says, we have something in the works for you. He did this, we feel, as a way to just letting the years go and that he had no intention of doing anything. Mango added that Stallone was simply placating Chuck and that to continue to use Wepner to generate publicity for Rocky crosses the line and adds insult to injury while Philadelphia attorney George Bocchetto says he is sympathetic to Wepner. He feels the Wepner case appears to him to be one that could prove legally difficult to sustain. Stallone believes likewise. Mango says his attorneys told him to bring it on, and Wepner said, All I want is what I feel I got coming, a piece of the rock. While Chuck's legal case against Sylvester Stallone was pending, he found himself caught up with the law in a forgery case. On August 11, 2005, the Associated Press reported that the FBI had released details regarding the guilty plea entered by former boxer Chuck Webner, who lost to Muhammad Ali in a heavyweight championship in 1975 and was using the prestige of that event and his career to sell forged Ali autographs. The files were sealed until recently, but... A press release now reveals that Wepner entered a guilty plea in May for conspiring to commit mail fraud. He admitted to selling memorabilia forged by John Olson, who pled guilty in 2003 and received three years probation, those sales taking place from June 96 through to March 2002. Among the items that were sold were Champions Forever boxing posters, gold ink versions that were forged, The Champions Forever forgeries were exposed in 1996 by Sports Collectors Digest, which quoted Wepner as claiming the forgeries were purchased from another party. Wepner said in the 1996 story, John, as in John Olsen, is a good kid. He buys things in good faith and sometimes he gets stuck. Wepner is scheduled to enter his plea and receive his sentence in October 24th in San Diego. Wepner and Olsen say most of their forgeries were sold through Brian Ginsburg. 
And Ginsburg was apparently the mastermind of the scam who was indicted recently in San Diego on 13 counts relating to the sale of forged sports and cele celebrity memorabilia. Ginsburg entered a not guilty plea and had a hearing set for September the 12th. Olsen was quoted in an FBI press release as saying Ginsburg paid him and Webner around $117,000 for forged memorabilia. In a related case, Michael DeSola of uh, Madison Sports pled guilty in March 2004 to mail fraud, again related to forged autographs, often Ali, and again in a case sealed until recently. DeSola was actually sentenced to three years probation and a $1,000 fine. So then in June 2006, Chuck Webner faced up to five years for his role in the mail order scam. He was actually sentenced to just one day in prison, and that was already served. 90 days home detention and a $2,000 fine in the San Diego Federal District Court. Going back to the Wetness Stallone case, director Jeff Furezegi uh, of the uh, ESPN 30 for 30 documentary called The Real Rocky said, in my opinion, Sylvester Stallone hijacked Chuck Wetness' soul. Well, after three years, Stallone was finally advised to settle with Webner out of court. In 2006, they reached settlement for an undisclosed sum. And now every time someone buys a Rocky DVD, Chuck gets paid. It gave Webner the right to say he was officially the man the film was based on and the chance to make a film about his own life without legal reprisals. Chuck, who's, who was 67 in 2006, continued to live in Bayonne condo overlooking the Newark Bay, the uh, high school football stadium where he had his first professional fight and he was living with his wife, Linda. They lived close to his three grown children and drove a Lincoln, which was gifted from the former New Jersey governor, Richard Hughes. His license plate reads champ and there is an image of a pair of boxing gloves painted on. He was still working for Allied Liquor and was one of their busiest sales reps in their business. He also had two agents booking him several appearances a month where he did motivational speeches and was working on a movie about his life. More importantly, he was free from cocaine and he said, I've been clean now for more than 12 years. I'm very lucky. I have my health and though I was never a champ, I'm treated like one. The new movie he was working on was titled Chuck, starring Leif Schreiber as Wetmer. Chuck was involved in production and told a story about him coaching Schreiber before the actor filmed the opening scene of the movie. Webner recalled, I told him, when the bear comes at you, you've got to step to the right and spin him and hit him with a hook like you do in a fight. Schreiber looks over at me and says, are you out of your mind? I'm not getting that close to a bear. We're shooting in clips. I'm not going to be in the ring with a real bear. Now, just as the film was going into production, a rival feature called The Brawler was announced by the producers he had previously worked with. In 2016, The Hollywood Reporter wrote, Chuck Webner is preparing to fight a former business associate who said, use confidential information to create an unauthorised movie about his life. According to the lawsuit, Webner is suing Mary Allo, claiming she was entrusted with confidential and proprietary information while attempting to secure financing for the film and used it to create a copycat project. Another lawsuit. Well, Webner's attorney, Lincoln Banlow, said, we are certainly shocked to find out about the competing project and we are more than prepared to do everything we can to rectify the situation. This is legacy and his story. And for someone to try to muck that up is really sad. The Hollywood Reporter continued saying, according to the suit, Allo was hired in 2013 to secure five to $6.5 million to fund the film. In exchange for 5% of the equity sourced and an executive producer credit. Now, Bandlow wrote in the lawsuit, Almost immediately after they were hired, Allo and Allo Entertainment began to deviate from the party's oral agreement and the confirmed terms. Among other things, Allo incessantly peppered plaintiffs with emails and phone calls, sometimes in excess to 12 dozen per day, with requests for alleged investors to adjust the budget 
interview the cast and or otherwise compromise the confidentiality and integrity of the project. Allo and her company seized efforts to obtain funding according to the suits and plaintiffs eventually found funding on their own. Late last year, plaintiffs learned about another movie based on Wetner's life called American Brawler. It was produced by Allo, Robert Simmons and Daniel Grodnick, who were also named as defendants to the suit. Now, this suit claimed comparison between the two scripts, sizzle, reels and marketing materials makes it clear that defendants use portions or all of plaintiff's scripts, budget, production, schedule, sizzle, reel and, and other production materials to develop their own copycat film which defendants apparently intended to release before the authorised Wetner film. So they're basically doing what Sylvester done. Yet again, this case was settled out of court for an undisclosed sum. However, The Brawler, which stars Zach McGowan as Chuck, was still released in 2019. The film Chuck was released in the UK as The Bleeder in 2016, and Lee Schreiber said, The most moving thing about Chuck's story is not the rocky part, it's how he took on everything that came at him. He fought his own demons that were harder than any of those, the great heavyweights he fought. And he won because of his tenacity and his heart. Every time Ali hit him in the mouth with that incredible jab, he seemed to get happier. You can't kill a man like that. That was Chuck's indomitable spirit. That was the story that spoke to me, and that's why I wanted to make his film. In August 2017, Chuck was diagnosed with rectal cancer. He had surgery to remove the affected tissue, and he said they took out two and a half pounds of stuff. After chemotherapy and 30 days of radiation, he said the recovery was the hard part. He had lost 30 pounds and struggled to sleep at night. He said the doctors gave him a clean bill of health one year later, but the healing was a slow process. And he explained to the New York Jersey.com in August 2018, One day I'm constipated, the next day I have diarrhea. Plus, I lost the weight, I don't have any energy, I lost my mojo, you don't feel like doing anything. If you get up in the morning and you do have three or four hours of sleep, you just don't have any pep. Most of the stuff I lost was muscle mass. Unfortunately, you can see my arm. And he jiggles his skin under his right bicep as he's saying it. And he says, I've never had that. Now, this came on the back of a series of other health problems Chuck had had in recent years, including spinal stenosis, major back surgery and a hip replacement. And Chuck explained that it hasn't been a fun time for the last five or six years. They talk about the golden years, but my golden years haven't been so great. But I'm still here. He was and still is, and, and you can go and watch the two films that are out there. The Chuck Web about Chuck Web now. You got the plus ESPN's thirty thirty series documentary called The Real Rocky as well. So you know if you haven't gone go and watch those. But before we end, let's round this off you know, on a positive note. And a longtime friend of Chuck's, Bruce Dillon, an owner of a car garage which served as also an unofficial Chuck Webner museum which has press clippings and uh, a framed pair of boxing shorts that Dylan admits that Webner most likely never actually wore, but it was like a little museum to him. And it was the garage owner who actually revealed the idea of a statue for Chuck Webner. He said, Chuck was presenting me with a community award in front of all these local dignitaries. And I knew he was going to make a joke about me. So I made a joke about him. I said, Bayonne has announced today the erection of a statue of Chuck Webner in front of City Hall to recognise his role as the real life Rocky. So people got up and started clapping. And then I added, and this marks the first time in 20 years, the words erection and Webner have been used in the same sentence. People were laughing and cheering, but then everyone come, kept coming up to me and asking, is it true about the statue? Is it true? Well, that was the moment that a statue to commemorate his friend was not such a bad idea after all. More than two decades and countless fundraisers later, finally, the real life Rocky was given the same honour as his fictional persona, Rocky Balboa, in 2022. 
Now, at the unveiling of Chuck Webner's £2,500 bronze statue, located in Dennis P. Collins Park across the water from New York, the local Bayonne mayor, Jimmy Davis, addressed the crowd. He said, There are those from Jersey who are so famous we know them by single word names. There's Frank, as in Sinatra, there's Bruce, as in Spring Scene, and there's Chuck. An immensely proud Chuck, dressed in a yellow tracksuit and cap, positioned himself between boxing superstars Larry Holmes, Iran Barkley and Jerry Cooney, and he spoke to the crowd and said, The reason that I'm here is because of all of you guys. I'll never leave Bayonne, and I'm going to ask the mayor, when they die and have me cremated, stick me in the ground next to my statue. That'll make me happy. He later said, I was proud of the fact they put up a statue of Sylvester. He deserved it. And it's a beautiful statue. I mean, my statue is big, but his, it dwarfs mine. I heard they paid $350,000 for the Rocky statue. This one here costs a lot less, but it's just as great as far as I'm concerned. So, that's the story of Chuck Webner, the Bayonne bleeder, the real-life Rocky Balboa. But as usual... We're going to leave you with a brief quote from one of our most colourful characters and it was written when the Daily Mail caught up with Chuck in 2020 and they wrote that Webner chuckles again as he recalls his reply to his wife's joke about spending the night with Ali. Come here baby, this is the greatest day of my life. And that Brilliant. is the story of Chuck Webner, which is again another episode which is completely different from what we've done for this season it feels less darker side of boxing but because of the stuff that he goes through throughout his life it certainly fits into the narrative his story his demons everything that he's been through he's certainly part of the darker side of the boxing he's probably just a lighter version of what we're used to doing and, and what you guys are probably used to listening to but his story has all these different elements to it really doesn't it you know the fact that he was involved in distributing cocaine he was a cocaine dealer for a time then he was involved in memorabilia forgery and I mean if, if that's not enough to sit in with the darker side of boxing then I'm not too sure what it is. But then you've got the other side of it where we've covered bits of his career and his moment with Muhammad Ali and the issues with the Rocky movies and Sylvester Stallone and the lawsuits that he can continuously had to go through. So yeah, his story certainly sits well within the darker side of boxing, but it is a lot lighter than maybe what you guys are used to. We had to have it here, Johnston, because Chuck Webner, mm -hmm. he, he, he's that type of character where, you know, he is he's a lovable rogue. And, like, you can't glamorise certain characters within this sport because some of them just do things that are too heinous to even glamorise them. But someone like Chuck, he deserved his glamorisation. He, he was, like, for me, a lovable rogue. He did some bad things, but there's been people out there that have done a hell of a lot worse. A hell of a lot worse. And I mean, look, he got done and he served his time in prison. You know, that, that falls in the category of the darker side of boxing. Not many boxers do actually end up for that stint of time in prison. And he, you know, twice. I know he only does a day, but time served as well for the memorabilia thing, which he should have got a lot more for, to be honest with you. By the sounds of it, he should have got a lot more, but he didn't. I thought it was a bit harsh to sentence on him originally. I mean, he could have gone down for life, but he refused to snitch on, on people. He, he, he was a heavy, really, for, for another a, a, a mobster, whether we know if that was actually him or not. We worked for him, we don't know, but, you know, he was a heavy. He did do it for quite a few years as well. So he falls well within the dark side of boxing category. But what a guy. Some of the quotes are absolutely outstanding. Although the, the best one probably does come from his wife. <laughs> what room should I go to? Kind of thing. That's, that's quality from Phyllis. Uh, absolutely superb line there. And, you know, even just down to Sonny Liston, when, he, when the referee asks him, how many fingers am I holding up? And he says, how many guesses do I get? That just clarifies the, the type of guy he is. Fighting bears, fighting wrestlers, fighting Andre the Giant. I mean... I know it weren't real, but still, stepping in the ring with Andre the Giant is a big deal. and It's, it's crazy, isn't it? It is a rags to riches. He does have a, a, a time in prison. Even in prison, he's glorified. He's even got the uh, prison off the, the main guard, not even the guard, the guy that runs the gaff, um, telling him, hey, look, Chuck, Sylvester's here. <laughs> Goes down and sees him, dropping jokes and all sorts. So, uh, definitely the lighter side of dark side of boxing. But it's nice to do these ones sometimes. It does feel like a lot, lot like a career profile, especially in the big main chunk of it but he does get arrested he does go do his time he gets out he's still alive today we wish him well to be fair um and i think most of us will a funny guy great character 
And um, yeah, it's just great to hear these stories, especially when you fight Ali and things like that. So I'm pleased for he got his statue and all that. So I hope he's living a good life. Absolutely. I'm pretty sure he is still living his best life. And yeah. what we've covered here is uh, an amazing story, which people fought over to make a film out of. Let's let's be honest. Like you yeah. had all these people wanting to make this film about Chuck Webner. This is a guy who didn't win a world title. This is a guy who, yes, he eventually fights for the world title, but he never won a world title. He was what people might say a journeyman at best a heavyweight journeyman yep. at best so some people will pretty much say that is him that is his career but he's lived off the fame of what's come off the back of his fight with Ali and everything that came following it and fair play if you're able to do that throughout your boxing career and still live a really good life in the end of it all then I think you've made it <laughs> I think you can't complain at that whatsoever you you know I think he's very grateful the fact that he's got a statue uh, erected in, in where, where he comes from I think is a huge thing as well I think the fact that he's being recognised and honoured in this way just goes to show you that sometimes there are people within this sport that do transcend the sport and I think Chuck Webb as one of them he might have not had all the accomplishments and accolades of a Muhammad Ali but he's certainly a character like Ali who transcended the sport in his own way and I think that's what's important to, to point out with Chuck Webner's career and his life and his story and some of the things that he did that were bad and then he was able to come back from that and turn it all around once again so yeah it's a kind of a, a heartwarming story more than a than a, than a heart stopping story when you've had some of these that we've covered this season so I hope you guys have enjoyed the episode and as always we ask you to leave any comments anything you want to talk to us about with regards to the episode or anything in the future that you would love to see us cover for another season of the show, then you can do that at darker underscore side underscore pod on Twitter. Or if you follow us on all of the other social channels, you can follow us at BTR Boxing Podcast Network. And you can do that on Facebook, on Instagram, on YouTube, on TikTok. And of course, as we've said, on Twitter also. I just want to take a moment to say a big thank you to the patrons of this podcast for supporting us through Patreon. It is truly a blessing to have you guys supporting us to be able to produce all these episodes and these seasons and go out there and get all this additional information that isn't easily accessible by going on Google and typing in Chuck Webner's name. You do have to pay for historical newspaper articles. You do have to pay for access to literature that isn't necessarily easily available. So the support we get from the patrons really does help with things of this nature. So a big thank you to you and I hope you've enjoyed having an ad-free early access version of the episode but if you guys are listening and you've been listening throughout the season and you've not checked out patreon.com yet please do because from as little as £1.50 or around about $1.75 you could be a patron you could get early access to all series based content you could get our exclusive patron only series boxing through the decades and all the previous patron only exclusive episodes that we've done as well you'll also have the opportunity to be able to have that community like feel and speak to other patrons and actually develop what type of content you would like us to produce for you guys so please do make sure you go on and check it out at least we know it's very difficult around the world at the moment with all these different things going on but even the minimal would really truly help us progress even further forward look at us We've come from absolutely nothing to get to where we've got to with the darker side of boxing and people absolutely love it and we love hearing from you. So if you get a minute, please just drop us a line. Let us know what you think of the series and the episodes and tag people in it. Let people know because it really does help and it really does show everybody out there that there is an alternative to the average boxing podcast and it is the darker side of boxing. Well, with that in mind, thank you for listening and we hope you've enjoyed this episode of the darker side of boxing.